Hello and welcome. I'll begin today with a prologue of sorts. Out of respect for the guys that created the Shelby Daytona, I'd like to clarify a few things on the story behind it as featured in the previous episode. The day I published the previous episode, I'm on YouTube as usual and noticed a recommended video from Shelby America that I hadn't seen before and which again I link to below in the description. To begin I had mentioned earlier that when Carol Shelby returned to America in 1959 one of the things he did was get involved in the sale of tires but I didn't recall which brand it was. Take a look at this. Do you notice anything? I most definitely did not it seems. It was Goodyear of course. And I mentioned that Carol Shelby had hired an automotive designer who had worked at General Motors. That isn't technically true, as Peter Brock pointed out that he had joined the team to be a race driver and was managing the driving school at Riverside, and Carol literally didn't know that Peter had been working as an automotive designer at General Motors. Also Phil Remington, who I plan to reference in this episode, was Peter's hero, but Phil didn't support the plans for the Shelby Daytona. And the references I made to the chassis of the Shelby Daytona being based on the chassis of the Shelby Cobra is true, but they had used the chassis of a crashed Cobra that Carol let them have to work on in a corner of the workshop. And true to the spirit of the hot rodder aspect of things in those days, when the Daytona began to take shape, the guys around the shop would help out in the evenings if they could. At one point, a friend of Carl's and a fellow Texan, Benny Howard, who was an aerodynamic consultant, visited the shop at Venice in California, and Carl asked him to take a look at the project going on over in the corner. Benny asked for the details of the car, questioning the chopped off tail design based on the designs from German engineers brought back to America after World War II, and that 385 brake horsepower would never be enough. The one person who did support the Shelby Daytona project was Ken Miles, who I mentioned had been the first person to test drive it. However, during the first appearance of the Daytona at Daytona in Florida in February of 1964, for some reason, Carol didn't want Ken to drive and the two guys who were selected to drive had never actually driven the car before. And it gets more interesting. When they took the Daytona to compete at Spa in Belgium, someone tried to sabotage the car by putting cotton material in the fuel system, thereby causing the fuel pumps to lose pressure. And in episode 2, I noted the similarities between the Shelby Daytona and the Ferrari 250 GTO. For example, the distinctive wing at the rear of both. In Spa, the Daytona was a little unstable, and when back in the pits, they noticed the wing on the back of the 250 GTO. So they took a strip of aluminium, or aluminium, call it what you will, and fixed it to the rear of the Daytona, which helped improve stability. And then later, cut off an additional inch or so, which made it just right. And the reference to Shelby America in the Shelby Daytona I drove in the previous episode is significant because it later won a GT class championship but with a team based in England whereas the car was actually American of course. And following that with the car still in England the taxman arrived and stated that if correct arrangements were not made the cars would be taken out and dumped in the ocean or shipped back to America, and which is the reason those original cars are still around today. And finally, and relevant to this episode, when the first four GT40s appeared at Le Mans, they weren't ready to compete, but the Shelby Daytona was, and in fact it broke a lap record. And now on to the main focus of this episode which will be the 24 hours of Le Mans from 1966. 
and which, as many will recall, is the first year that Ford beat Ferrari. We'll be driving the Ford GT40 Mark II. In 66, it competed against the Ferrari 330 P4, but as we don't have the P4, we'll use the P3. And also included was the Ferrari 275 GTB Competizione, which again we don't have, so we'll use again the Ferrari 250 GTO. And we'll also include, because we have it, the Porsche 906 Carrera. P15, heads up, get ready. Heads up, actually speaking of the heads up, the heads up display rather. Go, go, go. I added a speedometer here because uh, when I published the previous video I sent a, a link to an uncle of mine who liked the video but he commented that he couldn't tell how fast I was going. So, which was a good point. So, Tom, if you're watching, I hope this does the job. Try not to spin out. This version of the Ford GT40 Mark II from 1966 is a mod for Assetto Corsa. And a free mod, as is the Porsche 906 up ahead. Actually, I don't even have the link from where I downloaded this one anymore. And it isn't the world's best 3D model. It's a case of whatever you do, don't look down. But, uh, and it also has five gears. Whereas I believe the, the, in actuality it should have four. So what I've done is I've reduced the gear, I've changed the gear ratio. So that the, fifth, the top of the fifth gear would match the actual top speed. So in 1966, at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the Ford GT40 Mark II was 485 brake horsepower with a top speed of 215 miles per hour. Let's see, can I get close to that without crashing? Yellow flag, caution. Take it down a little bit. The Mark II was based on the Mark I, and the Mark I was based on a Lola chassis from the UK. So, this car was technically built in the UK, in Slough, I believe, which is in Berkshire. If anybody's watched the original Office series with Ricky Gervais, that was set in Slough. Also, the original. Um, Thunderbirds. The Thunderbird show was also made in Slough. Bit of a random fact of history. And this car ran a FE four twenty seven. 7 litre engine, or so I'm told, from a Ford Galaxy, and the engine had was also used for NASCAR. So the engine and the chassis were modified by Carroll Shelby and his team for racing. Apparently the engine better suited this chassis and obviously the results showed because they had a 3 GT40 finish in 1966 and finally won against Ferrari of course and the rest is history. So I mentioned Phil Remington in the in my prologue of sorts earlier and 
Phil was the was Carol Shelby's chief engineer and it's noted that Phil was a sort of unsung hero of 1960s auto racing and one of his innovations was a more efficient way to change the brakes during a pit because in 66 the brakes on the Mark II were over, tended to overheat I guess as was brake technology at the time so Phil developed a system allowing them to change the brakes more efficiently which allowed them to be more competitive and obviously aided in allowing them to win take it up the fifth see can I reach the top speed another character at the time was Dan Gurney Dan Gurney was another American driver who in 1963 drove for Ferrari and in 64 and 65 drove the Cobra Daytona which we featured earlier in this episode of course and in the previous one and Dan was six foot four tall so he's six foot four including his helmet meant that he didn't really fit inside the Mark II so they, so they added a bubble in the roof uh, roof ceiling of the um, of the car and I found a picture online of the number three which I believe Dan drove and which I think didn't actually finish in 66 but um, if you look closely at the picture you can see in the area which would be above the driver's head sort of a bump which was allowed allowing Dan to fit in the car or just about I suppose no doubt a bit of a tight squeeze anyway this turn is also always difficult now we're on lap two and I tend to I'll come across something and then I'll I'll sort of recall it later the leader's just done a three eighteen point two seconds March of last year ah, roughly about a year a year ago from now I was reading on racedepartment.com about the death of a famous British car and motorcycle racer John Surtees and indeed John Surtees was also to race at Le Mans in 66 for Ferrari but at the last minute they decided to give John's seat racing seat to uh, an Italian either a friend or family member of one of the people at Ferrari so resulted in that John quit at the last minute which was a shame as was his death last year of course you've just done a 3.52.9 I have enough uh, fuel for five laps I'm not going to pit this time and I have the um, damage off again with fuel usage on and tire wear on same as before and I slip gears I tend to do that a lot and I have all the assists off which is what I usually do so no traction control no ABS no stability control or anything like that course it makes the cars a little bit more difficult to drive but of course it's as it should be actually now that I think of it another thing that comes to mind one day I was doing some stuff on the computer Photoshop or whatever and uh, I had the 24 hours or the 12 hours rather of Sebring from 2018 on in the background 
It's available to watch on the IMSA channel on YouTube. You can watch it for free. It's a great service. And they, what they do is they split it into two videos, six hours long. And uh, so I'm going to take it up to. There's the magical 215. Um, so I was watching it, and at one point they were doing something like a, a live pit report or some such, and the cameraman took a long shot and zoomed in on the above the pit wall where there was a, a, a placard or something denoting that 1966 Ford obviously indicating a win at Sebring and 65 was listed as Chaparral which meant nothing to me I noticed it but didn't think much of it and then, and then later on I'm watching a video by Alex from the Extra Mile another sim racing channel I follow and Alex had bought a copy of Forza Motorsport 7 for the PC I think and he was going through the car list and making a video and one of the cars was indeed a Chaparral from 66 I think it was kind of curvy like the Ferrari 330 P3 P4 and a big wing on the back similar to what Lotus or McLaren were doing with their F1 cars back in the day kind of like a, an inverted aircraft wing which comes back to the topic I guess of how Benny Howard was criticizing this, the design of the Shelby Daytona by Peter Brock guess they were trying everything they could at the time and as we noted Peter Brock was referencing designs taken back after the war created by German engineers turn is always tricky this camera flashes I don't know if there's a way to turn them off okay Dave you're halfway home got plenty of fuel two laps remaining yep I don't know where everybody else is I'm not last, but I'm a bit lonely out here. And of course, 1966 was the was the first year that Ford won against Ferrari, and a major American manufacturer won at Le Mans. And Henry Ford himself, Henry Ford II himself, was there. And as they were approaching the win. He asked that the three the three GT40s that were going to cross the line, that they crossed the line together. And the result of that was that based on where the car started and based on where the cars finished, that the number two car driven by Bruce McLaren got the win, meaning that Ken Miles didn't. Ken was heartbroken because he'd missed the chance to be the first to win at Daytona Sebring and Le Mans and as you may recall he also didn't get to drive the Shelby Daytona during its first appearance at uh, Daytona in Florida and Bruce McLaren I think from New Zealand later or at the time was developing the McLaren racing team which of course is now Keep you McLaren. Today, Indeed, the McLaren P1 was on the cover of the former Forza Motorsport, I believe. Forza Motorsport 6 had the McLaren P1 on the cover. If I recall correctly. 
So it was Ford against Ferrari. So Enzo Ferrari had his continuous reign of wins finally broken. And it's said that Enzo was never wealthy because everything, everything he had, everything he earned, he put back into racing and de developing cars for sale was only ever a means to an end to fund his racing passion, which you can understand. And according to Carol Shelby, who knew him, and as we noted in the first episode, Carol stayed with Aston Martin in, for example, 1959, because he found Ferrari to be very political. The story of John Surtees, I guess, being an example of that. And Carol noted how Enzo Ferrari would turn drivers against each other. He would tell one driver what the other was saying about him and vice versa. And he would also, Enzo would tell his son not to get close to certain drivers because there's a high probability that they may start a race and not come out of it. Which of course is not a nice thing to say to a child but I guess that was the reality. Fifth. One more lap to go. Good luck. That's your quickest today. I was testing earlier and actually I was I was coming last and I I was coming down the start finish straight at the end of the fourth lap and then my session would just suddenly end. I couldn't really figure why. I think it was because I was running last, so and now I'm receiving a gift of a fifth lap, let alone running this for 24 hours. Can you imagine? And I ran the 250 Ferrari 250 GTO in lieu of the Ferrari 275. GTB competizione and I was thinking to myself earlier that it seems like a shame almost not to include the 250 GTO at this point and uh, I have a Thrustmaster wheel and uh, Thrustmaster released a uh, special edition wheel, a replica of the wheel from the 250 GTO and Alan from Team Team VVV in the UK did a review of it. Polished wood and metal, very nice looking thing. I think it was a 300 pound sterling or some such. Form of a collector's item I guess. Nice wheel if you can get it. I'm gonna miss my turn. Lock up the wheels. I guess nice if you nice wheel if you had a proper setup, maybe triple screens or not so much VR because with a VR headset on you can't really see the wheel. Finishing 10th, more of out of retirements, I suppose, but still not last, but not over the first, not over the, the winning line either. So not technically correct for 1966, but Shifter looks like some kind of monotone matchstick, so I think we'll uh, we'll try to finish. That in itself will be a reward. Let's 
Maison Blanche turn again. Try get it into fifth and not slip. Which is usually what happens. Tenth position. That's the end of the race. We'll get him next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or not. So if you like the video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd appreciate it if you include them below. Until next time.